Thank you. Okay, first of all, let me thank you, the organizer, for this uh, opportunity. I'm really glad to be here. And here is not exactly my neighborhood. It's not my neighborhood uh, for a conceptual reason. I'm from the physics department. So it's not as usual as you can think that the physicists meet with uh, this community, at least not in my, in my country. On the other hand, I'm not in my neighborhood by ge geographical point of view, so let me show you, let me start showing uh, uh, something about uh, my group. This is my research group. It's inside the physics department of the University of Perugia, and Perugia is this uh, medieval town right in the center of Italy between Florence and Rome. And there is a pretty old university so we celebrated recently 700 years of existence. <laughs> and uh, as my presentation mentioned, we have also two uh, spin-off companies. Actually, uh, one Italian spin-off company, and now very recently we have an American sister spin-off company that is based in Pasadena. So I'm glad to be here also for this reason. Um, let me tell you, what are we interested in? Um, we started our work uh, something like uh, 15 years ago, focusing our attention on wireless, autonomous wireless sensor. So the idea is to build this uh, tiny electronic device, which are energetically autonomous, that it can live without battery on board. On doing this, we realized that there were two major constraints. On one side, we had to deal the with the energy required to operate the portable devices. On the other hand, we had to deal with the energy available for portable, from portable sources. And the lower one is the real of what is uh, today known as energy harvesting. And we have heard uh, something on this topic uh, in, from the previous presentation. In order to make uh, this wireless sensor available, we need to bridge the gap by acting on both errors. arrows. This is something that we understood, uh, uh, not exactly at the beginning, but still the gap is too large uh, in order that we can make available such devices. So we started working on the lower arrow, and we had uh, uh, recently, con we concluded very recently, a European Commission funded project called NanoPower, where we addressed energy harvesting down to nanoscale. So we address three different uh, um, classes of devices. So uh, nonlinear nano oscillators to harvest vibration, uh, nano, micro nanoscale, heat rectification harvester, and quantum harvester. I'm not going to talk about this topic in this presentation. Uh, if you are interested, there is a, a community which is based in Europe because it's funded by uh, the European Commission, but it's certainly open to contribution from US. And indeed, very recently, we had uh, already started uh, a number of contacts. So we prepared the Zero Power Agenda. Thanks. And if you are uh, interested, you can uh, also go to the website, Zero Power website, and find the documents there. So you're very welcome to join our effort. Today, I will focus a little more on the other end of this gap. So, uh, clearly the goal is to reduce the amount of energy required to operate the portable device. And when we started thinking at this topic, uh, we started from a very basic question, which in a sense is also uh, quite naive. Why there is some energy dissipation instead of none? Is there any fundamental physical reason why we need to have some dissipation. Can we avoid the dissipation? In other words, can we operate a computing device without dissipating energy? So, as uh, yesterday I mentioned in a question that Feynman says that we do not know much about energy. And he was right. We do not know much much about energy, but one thing. We know that energy is conserved. And the main reason why we know that energy is conserved is that every time that we do an experiment, we make an experiment and we realize that some energy is missing, then 
we invent a new kind of energy. <laughs> Last time, it happened in 1905 with Albert Einstein that proposed the equivalence between mass and energy, right? So energy is conserved, but we have clear in mind that energy can be transformed. So energy dissipation is the process in which energy is transformed from one species to another. And the final destination of energy is usually heat. So we realized, uh, we came to this conclusion after many other scientists, of course, that the topic has to be addressed down to nanoscale. So the key issue in this business is energy dissipation at micro and nanoscale. How is energy transformed at micro and nanoscale? Are the same laws that are valid since the Industrial Revolution at larger scale, still they remain valid down to micro and nanoscale? This is a question that still needs an answer. So by working on both the, the side of the gap, on both arrows, we realized that the two topics, energy dissipation and energy transformation, actually they are two faces of the same problem. So they both sit on a common scientific ground, which is micro and nanoscale energy management. So on a broader perspective, we believe that this is really a, a hot topic. We need to address the problem of energy transformation, and if we will be able to do that, we will be able also to, to win the challenge. So the description of energy transformation processes at nanoscale can actually unveil new mechanism for powering the next generation of ICT devices. And the parallel, and I understand that this is a bit visionary, the parallel is the, the first industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution was indeed based on the discovery of the relations that connect heat and work, how to transform heat into work. Nowadays, we are still facing the same problem. We're still trying to understand the relation between heat and work, but at much, much lower scale. And the fundamental law, now they are called fluctuation dissipation relations. But there is another guy which came into play quite recently indeed, in the last uh, 70, 60, 70 years, and it's information. So let me present a new vision of a, okay, okay, new vision, our vision of a, a, a computing device. An ICT device, in our opinion, is a new special kind of thermal machine. Thermal machines were, were invented in, uh, mainly in Europe and US uh, by people like uh, James Watt, and they were used to transform heat into work. Nowadays, an ICT device, in our view, is still a very special thermal machine. It's an input-output system in which at the input you still have energy, like in a normal thermal machine, but this time energy is in the form of work. And at the output, still you have energy, but mainly in the form of heat. Not only that, there is another player in this game, and it's information. So an ICT device is a device that processes energy and information and output processes uh, uh, output uh, energy and information. The same amount of energy, it's in the input and the output. Energy is conserved. Not the same amount of information. Usually, an ICT device, the amount of information at the output is much, much smaller compared to the amount of information that you find at the input. Now, let me be slightly more uh, precise on what I mean. So, what I would like to do, I would like to start with the physical switches. So, let's go back to a very uh, basic device, which is relevant for our discussion. A device, uh, a switch is a simple device. Let's assume that it's a device that can take only two states, open and close. This is a very basic description. I, I, I can understand your objection. This is not even close to the devices that you are considering. But please follow me on this path just for a few minutes because I want to answer a fundamental question. Is there any limit on the energy that we need to spend in order to operate this guy? This topic has been addressed a long time ago 
no, I mean 70, 60 or 70 years ago by people like uh, John von Neumann and uh, um, uh, afterwards by uh, Claude Shannon and uh, more recently by Ralph Landauer and Charles Bennett. Okay, in order to describe the physics of a switch, uh, we need a dynamical model, okay? So we can use uh, a, a bistable potential in a, a Newton-like uh, uh, approach, equation of motion approach, or you can use uh, uh, the usual uh, uh, system with a movable set uh, just to describe uh, the difference between zero and one. Let's focus a little bit on this because it's uh, uh, more rich as a system. So in order to describe the dynamics, I need to move the, the, the ball from what, this well to this well. Okay? So this is a switch event. And this can be described mathematically by a second order dynamical equation. So M is the mass of the particle. This is U is the potential energy. And then I have an equation that drives uh, uh, the dynamics. Let's consider uh, a common procedure in operating the switch. Usually what you do, uh, you apply a large and constant force. So the role of the force is to act uh, for a certain amount of time by tilting the potential. So if the system initially is on this well, after the tilting, it will go on this well. And so the switch is realized. This is a three-step switch. How much work is necessary to do this switch? Well, that's easy to, to, the, to calculate. Work is force times displacement, and you have to integrate over the path. So in this case, the force is constant, so you can take it out. And uh, let's suppose that the, these two minima are distant uh, one from zero, plus one and minus one. So the work is two times the force, the constant force. Now, let's consider another uh, procedure which is slightly more popular among the people who do this uh, business. And in this case, instead of applying uh, a, a large force, you can do something smarter because you want to decrease the amount of work that you need to spend. So what you do, you actually lower the potential barrier. So the particle that initially is here, now it's free to move. And then you tilt very, very slightly in order that the particle is not at the center anymore, but now it's more inclined to go to the right. Then, when the particle is here, with the tilt is still on, you rise the barrier back, and then you uh, take out the tilt. How much is the work? Well, you can comp uh, compute the work uh, as exactly as you did before, and this time, the work is two times F1, but this time F1 is the very tiny force that you apply. So it's clear that in principle, if the force is really tiny, you can do this with the work which is close to zero, approximately zero. Am I right? Almost. In a real world scenario, we need to choose a barrier high enough to prevent accidental switches. In a real scenario, the system is subjected to fluctuations. So the particle does not simply sit at the bottom of the well, but it fluctuates. And usually, if you wait long enough, there is a finite probability that the particle will jump on the other uh, well. This is what usually is called a bit flip error. So what people do in order to prevent this, they uh, decide to choose a barrier which is high enough in order to make the probability of jump very low during the operation time. So the energy of the barrier usually sets the minimum energy requirement. But I want to stress that this is not a fundamental requirement. In principle, you can rise and lower the barrier without doing any work. We have seen before, rising and lowering the barrier in principle does not require any work. It is true that in uh, uh, microelectronics, this is usually assumed as a, an energy, the energy that you put on the barrier lost. And that's due to the technology, because usually this is done by charging or discharging a capacitor, and usually this energy is considered uh, uh, loss, lost because this is a lossy operation. But let's give a deeper look at the physics of switches and the role of fluctuations. So in a real device, actually, you, you have to take into account that the equation of motion 
as to take into consideration the presence of fluctuations. So we change a little bit the, the Newton equation by adding another force. And this force is actually the fluctuating force, the force that accounts for the fact that the system is not isolated, but is in contact with the thermal, thermal bat that represent the fluctuating force. So now you need to introduce a probabilistic description. This is called technically called the Langevin equation. This is not a deterministic equation anymore. It's a stochastic equation that still can be treated, but now you have to uh, take a, a probabilistic approach. So now you have to introduce a probability density that tells you what is the probability that your system sits on this well or on this well. And so even, even when you take into account the switch dynamic, you have to consider the probability of switching. This, this can be done quite easily. You can define uh, uh, in, ter in probabilistic terms uh, what is the probability to stay in this well, meaning in that zero state or in one state, and everything is quite simple. And now there is a, another uh, uh, participant in the game that you have to take into account, and this is the entropy. Entropy was introduced by, um, initially by uh, Rudolf Clausius, but the microscopic interpretation of entropy is due to Boltzmann, which indeed was a giant in doing this. And here we consider the, the most practical uh, entropy definition by Gibbs, which is associated exactly with the probability of being in one uh, well or the other well. So based on this idea, let's see what happened to the probability distribution. In this case, we are not considering the ball anymore, but we need to take into account the probability distribution of the ball. So let's see this second procedure, the procedure that we believed could be done at zero work. Indeed, the, the ball sits on the left, the left uh, uh, well, Mean that this is the initial probability distribution. Then what we do? We lower the barrier. Now the probability distribution becomes like this. So move from here to here. Then we apply the, the, the tiny force for the slight tilt, and then the probability distribution gets skewed. And then what we do? We keep the force, we rise back the barrier, this is the probability distribution. And finally, we take the force out. And this is the final probability distribution. So this is a switch exactly as before. But in this case, the work is still zero. But the, the, the entropy changed during the process. What happened? Here, we have zero entropy. And here, we have zero entropy. In between, in, on moving from here to here, the entropy increased. What is the change of entropy? The entropy here can be calculated to be KB log 2, from here to here. Now, when you want to go from this condition to this condition, this condition and this one, you need to decrease the entropy. Entropy reduction by the second law of thermodynamics cannot be done for free. So entropy uh, reduction is a lossy operation. And you need to spend a certain amount of energy. This is what Boltzmann uh, uh, left us. So, based on this consideration, we can now reformulate the conditions required in order to perform the switch by spending zero energy, meaning zero external work. First, the total work performed on the system by the external forces has to be zero. Second, the switch event has to proceed with the speed arbitrarily small in order to have arbitrarily small losses due to friction. I didn't mention this before, but in the equation of motion, you see, there was also... A, a, a friction term, okay? So you don't know, which was proportional to the speed in that case. And in order to keep that force uh, uh, small, you need to keep the speed very small. Third, the system entropy never decreases during the switch event. So we have to take into account also the third condition. Is this possible? Is it possible to realize a switch uh, procedure that respect all the three uh, requirements? Well, in principle, yes. And I can show you how to do it. In practice, it's slightly more complicated. OK, in principle, it, w it goes like this. This is the initial uh, state of your switch, and this is the final. On going from here to here, you do not want to increase entropy. OK, never. So what you do, you apply an external force that simply make the switch to change by keeping 
the probability distribution unchanged. That's uh, uh, what is the prescription. Uh, is this possible? Well, as I said, in principle, yes. In practice, experiment is still in progress. And I want to mention that uh, uh, Perugia in Italy is one of the places where we are doing these experiments. But there are other places, of course. And this is part, this uh, last activity is part of uh, a project funded by the Future Emerging Technology of the European Commission. Uh, the University of Perugia, NIPS Lab, is the coordinator of a project called Landauer, which is operating ICT basic switches below the Landauer limit. And uh, uh, other than University of Perugia, uh, there is a university in Germany, University of Würzburg, a uh, university in Portugal, in Lisbon, Instituto de Telecomunicações, and then uh, Technical University in Delft, uh, in the Netherlands. This activity uh, started uh, uh, some time ago and is a part of uh, a large-scale research effort at the European level that I want to, to tell you about. And uh, um, so we started uh, around 2008 trying to convince the European Commission that it was worth investing on this topic. And uh, uh, this is the time scale of a number of projects that have been funded. So uh, I already mentioned NanoPower, which was one project funded wi within the, the action called Toward Zero Power ICT. Uh, three projects have been funded here. And then we organized uh, a coordinated action, meaning uh, a networking activity to bring together European groups on this topic. Then eventually, uh, last year, Landauer project started as part of a Minec uh, uh, action. Minec action has seven projects funded. And uh, very recently, actually last month, we started a new coordination, uh, uh, coordinated activity in order to coordinate now the groups involved in this uh, uh, set of projects. In this coordinated action, now we have more than 50 groups involved in Europe. And uh, Kerstin Eder, that uh, spoke yesterday, she is also part of this coordinated action with the IACO Energy Aware Computation uh, Initiative based in Bristol. Uh, this is the, the, the list of uh, uh, leading universities on this uh, ICT Energy Consortium community. As you can see, uh, there is the University of Perugia, which is the coordinator. We have Roskilde University, uh, Karlsruhe, Barcelona, uh, um, AC, uh, APFL in Lausanne, Alborg, Itachi Europe, University of Bristol, Glasgow, and Cork, uh, Tyndall, Tyndall in uh, uh, Ireland. If you are interested, we are also um, taking care of a publication which is called Nano Energy Letters. The publication is free. You can go on this website and download the previous uh, uh, um, issues, and you are also welcome to, to contribute if you want. And very recently, we organized an international conference uh, last July, and also some people from uh, U.S. Uh, uh, participated. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for a very uh, insightful talk. Uh, in the interest of time, maybe you will defer the discussion to the lunch. We have two minutes for talk. For questions. We have two minutes for questions. Okay. You mentioned that there are some experimental efforts in this group. Can you elaborate on maybe some of the tacks are being taken to uh, experimentally check this this idea? Okay, as, uh, I'm sure that you are aware that in the last two, three years, a number of experiments has been realized in order to test uh, the Landauer principle. Uh, experiments were in uh, U.S., uh, in Notre Dame, for example, and also in Europe, University of Lyon, uh, just to mention two of the most recent. Uh, we are now focusing on operating uh, switches. So we do not want to test Landauer. We want to operate a switch down to zero energy. That's uh, the goal. And we are considering two classes of devices, or system, physical systems, I would say. One is uh, uh, nanomagnetic systems. And in this work, we are quite close to what Jeff Bocker is doing here in Berkeley. 
And the other class of devices is nanomechanical devices. And this experiment is done in collaboration with Technical University of Delft. Thank you. Okay. Maybe one more question. Uh, if not, let's change the professor again.